Good evening and welcome back to Shop Night Live. It's a beautiful Thursday night here in Canterbury, New Hampshire, and I'm glad you decided to walk in those virtual doors. And I hope you enjoy tonight. We are going to talk about kind of an extension of last week. Last week we got going on this beautiful design for, <laughs> for a jewelry box. We talked about uh, fitting out the box with this interior. If you missed that one, you can go back and see that, right? Oh, sh sure. They can go to our website, the Shop Night Live page. It shows there, or they can go to our YouTube channel. And it was called Designing a Jewelry Box, I believe, right? And um, for that project, I made this laminated curved top. Now, I don't... I don't think I actually showed making that, did I? No. We've done laminations at other times, but I didn't actually get into making this whole thing. But in a nutshell, you have a curved form, and you glue up three layers of stuff and squeeze it down and vacuum press, and there you go. Just like that. <laughs> There's a few little details in there, but that's essentially all it is. So, um, but, you know, I was doing some reading and some other this about this Welsh guy who visited the shop, not Terry Moore, some other guy years ago. Um, and I mentioned him the other day during one of these courses. And he was the neatest woodworker I've ever met. He had the most immaculate shop. I'd never visited it, but I heard how he operated, like vacuuming after every operation. And I went and uh, looked back at the book he shared with me. He gave me a book he had written, and I picked up some cool ideas in there. And one of them was um, along making a coopered top to, uh, or a coopered door in, in general. And I've looked at various techniques. I thought he shared an, a pretty interesting one that I wanted to pass on to you, because it's super easy, and it requires no clamps. No clamps. But I realize there's a little learning curve and a few little subtleties that you got to pay attention to that I've learned the hard way so you don't have to. All right. Like that. That's how it always goes, right? Um, I mean, we always have to learn the hard way. What's that? Oh, camera lady said, thumbs up. <laughs> sorry, she's shaking her head now. I'm sorry. How can I embarrass you when you're behind the camera? <laughs> anyway. I do that myself. I just want to remind you, and so do other people, to like, share, and go ahead and subscribe. If you like this content, come on. What's holding you back? I have no idea. <laughs> we are uh, also in the middle of a, um, the Shaker Chest of Drawers course. We're actually two-thirds of the way through. It's not too late to join, because when you join, you get full access as long as, as long as we're alive or you're alive. <laughs> you get full access to that course on as much as you want. You can go back to the videos and all that. So you haven't missed. It's an interesting marketing strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, but that chess that is coming along great. I'm excited for the next class where we're going to finish up the base, and then get into the drawer making. So enough of that. Let's get back to the job at hand. We're going to talk about coopering. And for that, I'm going to actually use this curved top as our example. We're going to make a version of this thicker. I mean, when I made this, this is actually the core of a, um, a top that's going to get another layer of laminations or um, like some sh shops on veneer. And I talked last time about about eighth of an inch thick material and creating a woven appearing pattern. So, you know, if it ends up looking too masculine, it's going to be a humidor. <laughs> Actually, it won't make much of a humidor, but it's not deep enough for the Winston Churchill stogies, right? So anyway, I'm going to make this out of solid wood, and we'll shoot for about a half an inch, a little more thick, and 
So I'm going to set aside the jewelry box. We don't need that right now. Let's set it over here. And for this, we're going to use some shop sawn material. So to make this, this um, jewelry box, we're going to make it in segments. So we're just going to cut these beveled edges so all the segments, when they're clamped up, will create the arc. Okay, we're going to, so we're going to basically cooper it like a barrel, except our staves, unlike a barrel, are only, are going to be straight, but have that slight miter so it makes the curve that we're after. Um, to do that curve, though, we want to set up first, but I'm going to show you how I cut it out of this, this pine. We're going to make our door out of pine quarter saw on white pine. And why I'm going to use that is two reasons. We're going to resaw this and resaw it to about, let me see, what did I end up with? I made some previously. So they ended up being uh, just a little heavy of a half an inch. So what I'm going to do is resaw this you know, I'd probably go 9 sixteenths or 5 eighths, cutting it this way. So what this is, is a piece of 8 quarter white pine. And if you look at it, okay, on this surface you can see it better. So you can see how flat the growth rings are to the surface. Like, look at that. That's just one whole cut of a growth ring. That's super flat to the surface. And then all of this white is the early growth of that year. So it's crazy how you got different rings so flat to the surface. So if you looked at the end grain here, you'd expect to see the growth rings planing out very parallel to the surface, as you can see right here. So they're in plane with that surface. That's also called plane sawn cut. So when you see the top of the board, this would be considered plane sawn. So this was a wider plank of white pine. And I'd like to use this technique as you may have seen in the uh, pizza, what do we call that? A pizza platter or a peel or when we made that, that tray? Uh, I think we just called it a pizza. Uh, server? Server, yeah. But that, that was a round disc. I meant to bring it out again because it had really wild figured um, it was like flame birch. And I used the same technique where I had a flat sawn piece of flame birch that was two inches thick and then resawed it into uh, thinner layers. So now I'm going to cut this way. Okay, every cut is going to be vertical this way. So the face is going to end up with the grain running perpendicular to the surface. So we're going to get this real linear grain here, which is called quarter sawn grain. So it's 90 or close to 90 to the surface. And it gives you a super linear, but it also creates this stable material. Let me just show you. I'll make a few cuts and then we'll talk a little more about the material and we'll start laying out our parts. I'm going to just come over to the bandsaw here. And I'll fire up the dust collector. I've already set the fence to a good 9 sixteenths to 5 eighths. And I've flattened one face and I've jointed to a 90 degree corner right there. Here we go. All right, so I just showed you a couple slices, but you can see now when we clean this up and when we glue it up side by side, we're going to achieve 
a beautiful grain match once that's cleaned up because all the linear grain is so stripy that it's really hard to pick up where the glue joint is especially if you keep them kind of consecutive and they're all from the same board you know I could book match them but I think I'm just gonna slip match them so they're slipped and they're at kind of just all the same going across and you get a nice pattern well um, Tom, is plain sawn the same as flat sawn? Yes, yes. Flat exactly. sawn? Yes, it is. It's, so just think of it as the grain is flat to the surface. So like this one, you can see how flatly oriented it is. Or you can think of the growth rings in the same plane as the surface. So plain sawn or flat sawn. But then when you get quarter, you're going to see the growth rings perpendicular. And that's your quarter sawn grain. You know, technically they say 60, um, 60 to 90 degrees to the surface is quarter sawn. Then 30 to 60 is rift. And then 0 to 30 is plain or flat. All right, so once I've got all my pieces cut, I'm going to have that nice linear match. But I also get the benefit of another interesting characteristic of wood when you cut it this way and that is it does not expand and contract as much seasonally with the moisture changes seasonally like here in the summer it's getting pretty humid now and then um, it's actually beautiful here today but we get a little humidity up here and it when you get the hum humidity all the wood slowly absorbs and just takes it in and the fibers in the wood actually swell and the thing wood expands that's why our doors are getting sticky in the winter and and all that but um, in I'm sorry in the summer but in the winter everything changes it gets super dry uh, every all the moisture goes out and everything dries and shrinks up so you have this kind of accordion like thing going on seasonally throughout the year but the, the important thing to realize is that plain sawn, or when it's flat sawn, like this is hard to see, because this board, wood moves mostly along the growth rings. So if you remember that, so it's mostly moving, expanding and contracting along the growth rings. When you turn it to the quarter sawn dimension, and across this way, so you'd consider this radially, radial to the tree. So the center of the tree is over here. So you're at the radius of the tree, or it's a radial direction. The radial, radial direction is generally one half the same movement value as with the grain, along the grain. So Did you say about how much, Tom? I said about one half. Oh, you did? Okay. Sorry, Steve Aston, I wasn't. You're going to get a demerit for not paying attention, young lady. <laughs> Sorry. Just making sure everybody's happy. I literally said it like the sentence Did before. You? <laughs> <God>. <laughs> so anyway. Shoot. Um, cover that very well. <laughs> the grain is all running. So this, when we glue up, you know, six or seven of these, whatever, this, this uh, door is going to have the movement value half of what normally you would see like if you have plain sawn in it so we're going to have that and the other great thing is it stays quite flat and true to whatever shape you put it in because you don't have the arching growth rings to the surface you have everything nice and true and aligned let me just show you the values here just very quickly we won't nerd out on the math too much but i had made this a little while ago for a guild group we were talking about um, various woods and movements and things and this is these are the wood movement values these these figures relate to the amount of movement seasonally or with one moisture I'm sorry with one uh, percent moisture change in the material so if you look 
these are some of the different species. In this column, we have the quarter song movement, and here we have the flat song. So you can see this value, 27, and it only moves 0 0.0017 in the quarter song, and all the way down. So you multiply this by the thickness, I mean by the width, and, uh, and then by the percentage moisture change, and you come out, you can actually figure fairly closely how much an actual board is going to move. But I want you to know something. This really fooled me early on. I had no idea this was true. But you see woods like ash, you have a, a movement coefficient of like 17. Um, well, let's go over here. Beach is 43, 26, 25, 35, all the way down. And then um, where's oak? White oak is 37. I thought like the harder, stronger, sturdier wood like white oak wouldn't move a whole lot. And that woods like pine, eastern white pine would be kind of spongy and move a lot. Turns out the opposite is true. Look at these coefficient values. Like white oak is 18. 18, that's 10 thousandths, right? Yeah. Um, and pine, eastern white, is only 7. So. Look, this is the quarter sawn value of how much it moves. So that's what we're dealing with right here. So we're going to make a door that's going to have actually the lowest movement percentage-wise of any North American wood. So we're going to use that. It's technically a softwood. And so at 12 inches wide, we did the little math here, pretty much a good average or the typical swing you might get with moisture change in a year, like from winter to summer, is 6%. So if you had a 12-inch wide board of white oak, you multiply by the value and then by the 6, six and you will come up with the amount of movement. So it actually comes out to 0.129, which equates to one-eighth of an inch seasonally. That's the quarter sawn. But the plain sawn is going to be one quarter of an inch. And of course, it, it depends on, this, on the, the quality of the wood. You know, the really fast growth stuff tends to move more than the old growth. And then you have cherry is going to be 3.30 seconds. Same deal, 3.16. But look at this. White pine moves only 3.64 of an inch over 12 inches wide with 6% change in moisture content. So that's what we, we've got here. We've got the best stable material. Now, you. aren't you relieved? I am. I just <laughs> made my night. I was thinking of putting this in the bathroom so that it, that's going to take a lot of moisture content. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good I, reading there. Maybe I didn't nerd out on that too much. But anyway, went ahead and sawed these up, and we're going to set this aside. And... Here we go. We've got our layers all cut, and these are ready to glue up. Now, these are not from, these are from the same plank, so they should match up pretty nicely, but I didn't keep them in perfect order. Um, I'll explain later. Anyway, let's figure out the angle we need to make on our staves, like the width and the angle to achieve this curve, okay? So let's just put it down. I'm gonna put this on this piece of paper here and let's draw this arc. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Whoops. Are you? I appear not to be. <laughs> Hold on a second. There's a lot of white here, so it, it's... Oh. Should I not do it on the white? No, it's, it is what it is. I could do it on this surface. Okay, keep your plan. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I'll do it this way. So here's the arc. It's going to draw a nice curve here. I'm just tracing this arc to get that curve. I'll make a little tick mark on each end. Now I'm going to, I know I'm going to dress these down to right about one and seven eighths. So I set my dividers to one and seven eighths, just slightly under. 
and I'm going to start right here. Okay, so these this is this is describing the outside width of my curved door. So this is the outside. So I'll just go right in, nice point right on the line, and just walk it down. So I'm stepping off the staves. And I'm going to end up with like six. I figured out I needed six to get this top. Now this, I'm using this top of the jewelry box as just an example. Um, but more commonly, you might do this on a door, you know. Um, so I'm also, that got me really thinking about changing up my, making a hanging cabinet with a solid staved door and a nice curve like this uh, in the James Krenoff fashion. So once I have that, I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to take these two points, which are right on the line, I'm going to bring my rule, my straight edge up to it, and bump right into it, and see if I'm against the line here. Yep, and go back here. That's good. I'm right there, so now I'm going to make a nice straight line. I felt it hit each of those dots. So I'm tangential, you know, to, I'm hitting right in the center of each of the width of those dots. Now I want to find the center. I want to go radially out to where the center of this arc would be. So I'm just going to use some dividers and, well, my compass. And I'm going to make a, a mark here. And then I'm going to go on the other side to this point that we stepped off. So that's, that's exactly equal distance from the center of this point right here. And then I'll make a nice mark here, okay? So when I, when I do that, I created almost like a triangle where this is in the center at the base of the triangle. So I'm gonna now connect, let me put a point right in here. This will make it a little easier. I'm gonna put a point right where these intersect. It's like old time geometry. Now I'm going to just go right to that point. That's my center. Swing over my rule. So I capture that dot and that dot. And now I can make another mark here. Okay. So this, this line I just created here is actually the angle, the miter, angle of two of these staves. So if I went around the circle and I described each one of these I stepped off, I would get the same relationship, the same angle to my arc on this one. And this one I would just have these lines coming in, you know, like this. They would all be the same relationship to here. But this one is telling me just what I need. And then I have that line is showing me. So that's by doing that straight line connecting two dots, now I can take a couple straight edges like this. This is straight. I'm going to use this right along the line. Let's see. Okay, that's dead on that line. Now I'll bring in another straight edge. I'm going to go along my other line. So this is going to show me the angle that I want to set my saw at on the end of the, each edge of these 1 and 7 eighths inch wide boards. Okay, so that looks good right there. I'm going to hold that there. Then I bring in my I already set this so it should be spot on, and it is. So this is my, my uh, bevel gauge. I bring it up, I loosened it, and then I just brought it up and tightened it up right there, and it's spot on, hitting there. So that little angle is off of 90. That's my miter angle for each one of these 1 and 7 eighths staves 
to give me this arc. Hope that made sense. But what it turned out to be, I checked it on a protractor, I mean on my rule. Let's, let's go over to the table saw and we'll rip these up. Uh, let me keep them kind of a, somewhat in order. Okay. All right. So do I need anything else? I guess I need this. All right, let's head over to the table saw. So the beauty of working with bevel gauges like this, whenever I'm making chairs or even things like here, I, didn't, I don't know what that, these degrees are. And I don't really need to know because I'm going to go directly to my table saw blade. This is, this is it. I don't need to know the numbers. I'm going to come over and very directly rest on the table and I adjusted my, I lean my table saw blade over. So if you look right in here, I already leaned it over until it hit flat right between two teeth. So I know that that blade is perfectly laid over for this angle that I want for these staves. Now, it'd be nice to know what it is though, wouldn't it? So. I'm going to use my little Wixie thing. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> and I'm going to set this Wixie thing here. Um, maybe, maybe I could set it so you can read it. Here, you stay where you were. I don't know what it's going to say. I guess I'll come over here. I, I figured it out the other way, so this could mess me all up if it's different. But Okay, it's point one. I'm going to zero it out. Okay, so that's the table is zeroed out. And now I'm going to attach it. You can't touch the table, this camera lady. <laughs> now I'm going to attach it to the blade. It wasn't actually zeroed out because I touched the table. Wait, what did it go to? I think it was point 0.1 apple 1. You are going oh, after oh. class today. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, don't, don't, don't lean on okay. it either. Okay. It's kind of shaky. I'm sorry. Oh, look. There it is. <laughs> okay. All right. It popped back. It was fine. All right. So now we're going to set it on the blade. All right. What are you reading? 8.14 or yeah, is it 1 or 7.4? It's 87.4. 8, 87.4. Sorry. My eyes. Okay. <laughs> so far away. That's okay. So 87.4, that means our blade is leaning, you know, off of 90, 8.74, or you could think of the complement of that being 2.6 degrees. So that's all it's over. It's 2.6 degrees. Who makes that gauge, Tom? It's Wixy. I think he might, maybe he means the bevel gauge. Is that a gauge too? Both of yeah, this is a I digital think. angle gauge. Okay, Wixy. Yep, W-I-X-E-Y. I should have put that in the connection, but I wonder where they have it. Anyway, um, so we've essentially got the same thing, if, but this is what I'm going to be using for here. Now, I, I don't need the blade that high. I'm going to drop it down, bring my fence over, and what I did was I already dimensioned my stock, and I jointed one edge, but this edge is still rough. So I'm going to run these through, and I'm going to be holding it. Let's see. I got, I'm set at about two. So these ended up, these are still, this rough saw on a quarter was a good, healthy two and an eighth plus. So I've already dressed it, but I still have almost two and an eighth. So I'm setting my fence at two right now. I'm going to move it over to one and seven eighths, and then we will um, go ahead and and cut um, the angle on both sides. Yeah. I'm sorry. He did mean the bevel gauge. I got this. Uh, this is an old one. This is a. That was a Stanley. I don't know. I got this at a flea market, like an old tool flea market. I just love these things. So I have a bunch of them. This one's a nice size, um, but you can get them at old tool flea markets, and just. You know, look that everything feels straight and square. This has some nice brass fit and fittings on it. And anyway, you can also buy brand new ones. There's a lot of 
variation there. Um, some people should chat in. Like, what are some of the ones that are typical? I can't think of it. The one Polly. I have. Um, Shinawa. Shinwa. I have a Shinwa, that big all metal one. And then um, there are some very, you know, boutique like. Very expensive versions too, but I like the old Boris ones. Boris Veritas makes one. Yeah. Yeah, Veritas. You can uh, get them most places. Would you be willing to demonstrate this on a with a hand plane? Dean's asking. Can you demonstrate how to do that with a hand plane? Do what? I'm assuming make that angle. Oh. <laughs> Is he joking? No, I don't know if he's joking. Um. <laughs> You're laughing like he's joking. He might be joking. I don't know. You'd have to be holding your hand plane at a certain angle. I thought of it like to set up a shooting board. You could set up a shooting board that was adjustable so you would, it would pivot and the, and the plane would ride here and you'd just raise your board up to 2 and 2.6, right? And you would shoot by until you created a flat. But we're going to, I don't know if that was a serious comment, but we're going to use the table saw to rip this. And then I'm going to show you two ways. Actually, you could clean it up with a, a hand plane or the joiner. I'll show you both ways. If you don't have a joiner, you can do this with a hand plane just he, as well. He was not joking. He's thinking old school. OK. Yeah, you would have to set up a shooting board, Dean, like that would pivot. But because you'd have to hold your hand plane at exactly whatever degree you wanted. I don't, it's not really necessary when you have tilting table saws, this is what it really shines at for this kind of thing, and the tilting fence on the joiner. But once you've established the angle, you can then clean up that surface with a hand plane by just holding it flat and true on whatever that surface is. And that's what we'll do in a minute. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and rip these. I'm going to keep the face up the whole time. Then I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to move my fence over and rip them again. And then I'll come back to you. Here we go.
Okay. Let's head back. All right. So now we've got all the inside, both edges angled so that the outer surface, they're angled in like that. It doesn't look like a lot here, but we have 2.6 degrees on each side. So when they come together, boom, let's put it correctly, the total angle will be twice that. So this actually is going to be dropping 5.2 degrees, right? If I put a straight edge across here, that would be 5.2. We have just 2.6 on each half. So what we're going to do is now clean up these surfaces right off the table saw. You could still, you could get a decent glue joint there, but I just like to clean off that rough saw. So we could do that. This is to follow up a little bit on Dean's. Once you've ripped that surface, you could hit it with a hand plane. I'll use my big old miter plane. And you just want to hold that true and flat. So I've got both fingers on each side. I'm just going to let this track nice and flat. And clean it up like that. Try not to lose the angle. So it takes two passes and it's beautiful and clear. I could go ahead and hit them all like that, but I'll show you another method. I'll hit the other side um, on the joiner. So let's see. Okay, that one's already done. Make sure I get all these oriented the right way here. Yep. Okay. So the outer surface is here, so I want to put, lean my joiner fence over. So if you want to use the joiner, you're just going to take your same bevel gauge over to the joiner. Come on over. Well, you can just kind of zoom in. Your light's not on, you know. Oh, I guess you know. And set in the same way, you're going to lean your joiner fence over to the exact same angle. So I already did that while you were here, so we wouldn't have to fuss with it, but it's dead on right there. And now I just set it to take a light skim cut, and I'm going to hit each face one time, except for that first one that I already joined it on one side by hand, and it looks perfect. So here we go. I have no sniping. I don't have any on that joiner. I've got it set. 
nicely. So, um, it, <laughs> what you need to do is set your outfeed table at, at the exact same height as your cutter head. Okay, so you find the, you rotate your cutter head, and when you see the apex of your blades, you need to put like a straight edge or even a straight board on your outfeed table. And if you rotate your blade just till that board just barely moves, then you know you're at the same height. Your outfeed table is set at the exact same height as your blades because then you won't get a snipe because when you, your infeed table is lower, when you get up on there, what causes the snipe on the joiner is your outfeed table being lower. So once it drops, you get this little bite because it's too low. So we will uh, not have that once you set that. So this is not going to give me any snipe. Well, yeah, you could, but if you want consistency oh, in the I width. Want, I don't think they heard my question. I didn't know. Oh, that. okay. Could you just skip uh, the yeah. joiner, excuse me, skip the table saw and use the joiner? You can, but you want to maintain the consistency of the width all the way down. So you're going to rip them either way, right? You've got to rip them to width. So they're all the same width. So why not hit it with there? If you did, if, then you would go to your joiner and you'd have to set it for a deeper cut. And yes, then you could go ahead and joint both sides. But sometimes on the joiner, you can get a little off on, with multiple passes or whatever and lose your parallel. So I like to just establish parallel and get the angle. If you want to clean it up on the joiner, you can. Like I said, the joiner is almost an optional step because I could have glued that up and it would have been a pretty nice joint because it was a pretty nice surface coming off there. But I just went that extra mile. Okay, hope that makes sense. Yeah, David's asking, did that SCM come with, uh, come like that or with a swing fence? Most combo machines I've seen use that Euro style guard. Swing guard, sorry. Did it come with that guard? Yeah, that, that SCM came exactly with the guards that you see there. Um, I think you might be talking about a different kind of guard that um, I can't, can't really describe, so I don't have it. <laughs> Do you mean to not have the light on? Okay. It's just weird to look up without the light on. <coughs> All right, so now I can put my dividers away and hopefully all the math worked out, right? Let's see what happened. <laughs> Fingers crossed. We're going to set this aside. And now comes the gluing up and clamping, non-clamping method. Okay. Um, we need something to hold them together, but not your typical clamps. Instead of clamping, we're going to use tape. Tape is going to do this. Now, if you have some good one inch wide masking tape, some good quality, that would be fine for this. But my masking tape is pretty cheap. My three quarter, I guess it's not the best. This is like the Bucko Roll Walmart brand. It's fine for most things, but not for this. So I'm going to use my heavier, more rigid and tougher masking tape. It has a little stretch to it which is kind of your friend, but as you'll see, can also be a bit of your enemy in this. So you could even use packing tape for this, you know, something that doesn't stretch at all. But here we go. I'm going to just lay all my pieces down. Um, let me get them all. Make sure they're all oriented. Okay, so it's hard for you to see this, but all of those lines are angled like they came from a point. So usually I mark on a board and I get all the lines established in the same direction. So these are relatively in the same direction all there. They're not in sequence though, so, but you can move them around if you like. But you can see how nice that match is coming up. I could move them around to create a little more of a match if I wanted, and 
There we go. That's good enough. So then I'll get it pretty close to square across the end. It's not super important that I get it square because I'm going to trim this square, but I'll just get it close so I have kind of a ragged edge down there. All right, so I've got, you can see all the little gaps down here. So when I pull this together, it's going to arch up. Let me make sure I got everything right. Yeah, that looks good. So now what we want to do is tape across the outside surface. And it's going to be like a strong back tape. So it's going to hold that surface tight together. So you see how nice those joints are. And it's hard to see the joints at all. So I'm going to go across this end. I'm going to push it down tight here. And then pull. Let me get. I'm going to go. Sorry. I'm going to slide over this way. And I'm going to pull across, stretch that tape so I'm getting some tension across all of those joints. Now as I do this, this one's going to want to curl up and flip up. So that's the only place I'm, I am going to cheat and technically use a clamp, but I'm not clamping across the boards just to hold that from flipping. And then I'm going to now I'm going to space these fairly close together. I made a mistake on my first one, and I only used three pieces of tape. I thought that would do it. But I discovered, and I'll show you what happened. Um, I pulled out my joints just a little bit. But so each one I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to pull, get a good pull. See, I did that on purpose so you could sense how I'm pulling this. <laughs> I always do those always things. So I always do these things on purpose. I never make mistakes. And am I glad? <laughs> You've noticed that, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have to tell you that. All right, so now I'm going to just keep on going, pulling right across, getting those joints nice and holding that together this thing to stay together nicely. So I guess I'm going about every three inches or so. And one more. To clamp a curve like this is it's a little tricky, you know, if you were going to put regular bar clamps Wants to, of course, it wants to pop up, and then you have to put clamps on the top to hold pressure down and get a balance. So this method, if you're not putting a ton of pressure, you can actually, this will do the job. Now I'm going to go the long way down the seams. So I'm, I gotta, the seams are almost hard to see, so I'm going to have to look, cheat at the, looking at the end. Kind of fun though, because pretty fast you can make a curved door. It's a lot faster than laminating, you know. And it does have the kind of the integrity of a just being solid wood. You can amuse your friends, All right? So, when are you going to trim uh, for length? Is this a good time to trim for length? I'm going to trim after. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'd have to cut it to size anyway. And sometimes you don't get glue or something. It's going to be a little... <coughs> so it's hard to... Oh, you mean after it's all taped up. <coughs> um, no, I'm not going to do it right now. I'll do it after on the table saw. It'll be bowed, but it'll be fine. All right, so once I get all the glue, the tape down, I want to make sure it's really adhered. So a ruler like this is like you going and really pressing on all the seams. I use this in veneer work just to make sure the tape is down and everything's held flat. Beautiful. All right. <laughs> now, this is where it gets fun. I'm going to get the glue. 
Mr. McGlue, and flip this over. So let's just test it. Look, if I bend it, see I'm bending. All the, the tape is like a, a firm spine holding that outside together. And look at the inside. Beautiful. We've got that sweet curve. So what we want to do is get the glue into all these joints quickly and then we're going to clamp it up or actually just tape across that arc. Just run some tape to hold it up like that. And that's all we need because we're all taped firmly on the, on the face side. Okay. So this you have to do fast. Now if you're doing a larger panel, this is about all I would want to go in one step. Like, Five or five joints, maybe maybe six, because the glue's going to start drying in there uh, by the time you get it brushed out quick. And when you go to clamp or tighten this with the tape method I'm going to show you, it it might be slightly gapped. Okay, so you can do it in stages. You could I could do just three of those seams, clamp it, tap tape it up. Once that dries, I could come back and these would fall open. These would be fine. Do these two and then reclamp that. So you, anytime you have a complicated glue up, just take it in stages. All right, so here we go. Are you ready? We're, we're just thrilled. You're thrilled? Your glue. Okay, here we go. Thanks. Every time. <laughs> Are you serious? Partially. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, so I'm going to actually smear this out because I can't do a rub fit and I want it to be nicely balanced in here not too globby that's why I gotta move pretty fast knowing you and your tape Charlie's asking if there's any difference in the spacing if he were to use blue tape it just it's good to use wider tape Charlie if you could use wider tape for this um, it gives you more you know, I would use at least one inch. You could use two inch tape and it would give you a great hold, you know. Um, he was so joking. I'm just using what I got. Yeah, I, I know, but I was, it allowed me to make a point about that I tape. Um, Joe's asking, what about using a thinner glue slash longer setup time? This is a longer setup, um, but yeah, that's not a bad idea. You could use Type Bond Extend or something. This is Type Bond 3 and it does have a longer time but it's just a little bit on the warm side if you're trying to do a long thing but that's that's a great point thanks for mentioning that use a longer time glue if you you'd like it gives you more okay but these joints are coming together beautifully I can see how nicely they are hitting Right, that's it. So now we can pull it up. You should see a little squeeze out along them all. That looks good. Seeing a nice little tiny line. Not seeing any right there in the middle, but that's okay. But I'm going to hold it in that position. And now just get a piece of tape, wrap it around there. I'm going to bring it across and just hold it. So I, I can't bend it any further. And just get that tension on there. And they're closed up nicely on the middle. I'll put a couple more in here. You applied glue only to one side of the joint, Joseph's asking, right? Correct. Yeah. It got, it got to both sides. You got to put enough that it's going to distribute. And you can see the amount of squeeze out I have that we got a good distribution there. I put a nice bead down one side, brushed it out, and then it did move. I needed to move faster so one side did it. Okay, now that should do it. I've got good pressure all the way down that's holding those joints nice and tight. That looks great. If you want, you could put more, but here's the thing. The first trial one I did, I over pulled it. I didn't have as much tape on the face. And I'm going to show you that one right now. 
effect. I only took a peek. So I, I let that glue like, oops, that piece of tape is coming off. I'm going to put an extra one. Make sure these don't come free on us. Okay, there we go. So that's being held nicely into that sweet little barrel lid shape. Let's see how it conforms to our other. How did our, our gauge come out? Pretty sweet, huh? Right there. That looks pretty accurately close to that other curve. So our math, our method with the geometry gave us that curve beautifully. All right, so <clears throat> now we're gonna, I'm going to show you this one that I did earlier. And see, I only put three pieces of tape across. Bad. <laughs> you need more because these ended up not, when I, and when I pulled these, I pulled them really tight. I was, I got the inside great, but I took a peek at one of them. I mean, that one looks pretty good. It seemed, that one's fine, but I know one of them I started to pull slightly open. It's probably no big deal. Maybe it was a shadow line. faked us out. Thanks. No, no, it really is slightly, it's very slight. I think, I just feel like, see that right there? That's just slightly open. Now, I'm going to do a little cleanup on this, and maybe it will be closed just below the surface a little bit, because what we need to do is plane these facets off so we can create the smooth arc. Let's get all that off. So what we're going to do is really establish our curve, smooth and everything. Then we'll trim to length. Because when you shape things, when you've got to clean up the surface and curve it and all that, if the end is the actual length, it's hard to do a nice job even all the way out to the end. So if you can do the shaping, and then we'll trim off the ends, which won't be as nice as the inside. That looks pretty good, though, huh? Just. Tom Martin's asking, why not use a, use a <coughs> gauge as a guide when gluing? A uh, what? A gauge? Why not use a gauge as a guide when gluing? The gauge. There's a lot of different ways to brush out or evenly distribute the glue. Is that what we're talking about? Um, you can, there are these small little glue combs. You can comb it out, which I don't have. So I was using that brush Maybe to do the same. Maybe you can ask that differently. Um, John's asking, would large rubber bands work for a final clamp? I think so, John. Whatever, whatever gives it the pull without um, opening these face joints. So the important thing is to make the extra tight cut so you end up with nice face joints and then yeah I think rubber bands um, anything maybe shrink wrap anything that's gonna pull that inside so these joints close up once they close up you've got such nice glue joints these long straight joints these miters you've effectively clamped them all beautifully kept it tight on the outside and you can see it tight on the inside so and once that glue got a little rubbery, I just scraped it off before it got on there. Let's just do a little cleanup, and we can go from there. Now, normally you would have the arc. I don't have, let me see if I can. Martin clarified. He said he has the shape slash pattern already cut. Why not use it? Say that again. <laughs> this pattern? He has the shape, oh, pattern is the word, already cut. Why not use it? This? I don't know. Um, this, I'm showing another method tonight of <laughs> coopering a door, making it out of solid wood rather than laminated. This is a laminated curve. So 
I could already, I could use this if that's what we're asking. I'm sorry for misunderstanding. But. He says yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to hold this up so it's hitting the flats. If I had a pattern, it would be better. But you can see this is such a subtle curve that if I come in here and draw this arc, I lose it every flat. And every time you hit a point, this is not the best way to do this. But if I had a pattern with this curve, I could actually draw the curve on the end. I'm not going to worry about that. I just want to show you how you can quickly establish what feels pretty close to a curve. Set this down. Bring this up. I'll put a couple clamps here. This will just be my stop. So it doesn't slide off the bench. And I'm going to bring this in and hit my stop. Now you can see those facets. So I want to plane right on those facets. I'll try the block plane first. Let's see how this goes. I could put something behind here too. Let's see. Um, I'll use this. I need, I wanted something a little thicker than that, but maybe that'll work. Just want to pin that so it doesn't move. So just focusing on the facet until I can feel it blending into a curve here. That already feels almost round, nicely rounded. This is, this is kind of fun because it goes fast and you can shape the curve by yourself. I can still feel where I'm a little bit angular, but first we'll just go over it quickly. Just getting very narrow shavings at first, and then they get increasingly wider. White pine is a pleasure to plane too, and the smell of it. It's like a treasure chest. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that. A lot of 18th century furniture utilized white pine as the core material for veneering over, like when they were making like curved drawer fronts, like in the federal period. They would bricklay up the drawer fronts in white pine and then shape and plane the curve and then hammer veneer the veneer right over it because it was so stable. So nice and easy to to shape like this it makes a wonderful substrate, and that was traditionally the choice material for the substrate. So they knew a lot about the stability of white pine then as well. Now, once you get it, you can sand. It's tempting to go diagonally, right? And then straight, you might have more to clean out if you go diagonally. But I would spend a little more time 
like I can feel anywhere you feel like a little ridginess just go right hold right over that ridge and it's just gonna be nuancing this thing until it feels sweet like a curve and then after you're done sanding you could use a little palm sander you'll have a beautiful little lid like this. Keith's asking where you got the pine, do you know? The pine? Mm -hmm. I got this at Goose Bay. Pete? Yeah, this is some Goose Bay as well. The great thing is you just need quarter saw, I'm sorry, plain saw and eight quarter to reproduce this because you're going to slice it into layers and get this gorgeous quarter saw linear look. Now this will, let me get my... Are you going to smooth the other side? Yeah, that's the tricky thing. Like, so you got the facets on the inside. You need um, the old barrel makers. What was it called? A stoop, a stoop plane, like the word soup, but a T in there. A stoop plane, which had a kind of a concaveness to it. Now, I'm not sure if my scrub plane will fit in there. But let's give it a shot. Um, Chip's asking, why not use a spoke shave, Tom? You can also use a spoke shape for the outside. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you could also. But with the the block plane just is a true, giving me true straightness. So yeah, you could do that as well. I feel a little... All right, so this body of that plane is too wide to get in there because I have a nice, cam a strong camber cut on that. So you'd have to use different tools. You could use even a... A spoke shave here. If I was doing a lot of these, I probably would grind a spoke shave with a nice curve, and then I could come in here. And all you have to hit is the flat in here, because you're just going to recreate an inset. But you know, excuse me, for for like a cabinet door, it wouldn't be awful if you left the faceting, or you can even use card scrapers cut when you're bending them you could card scrape hard down the middle that's not a, my sharpest one Let me see if I can hear this one my little guy so this one is so you would go down each now something like that you want to steady it put a st stick under each side like this and Let's see, should be able to steady it. It won't rock that way, but so you'd go ahead and scrape the inside and create a nice kind of curve. So I am getting some dishing out there. Do you have a concave card scraper? I have a French curve, but it's a little too extreme. Okay, so. This could work, but it's more extreme than, you actually can achieve it quite nicely, the curve that you want here with a standard card scraper if you just flex and you get that, okay? That's why I was using this. Bob's asking if a compass plane might work. Um, a compass plane goes more, it would be going more across the grain, so I don't know, I'm, I haven't tried it. I bet it would but you'd have to then come this way and clean it up. It's more cosmetic on the inside. It's, it's really the outside that you're trying to get. You can clean up the inside and get it pretty decent. And I don't have a stoop plane, but I'm gonna look into that. I don't do a lot of coopering. So this is kind of a nice adventure to uh, make a solid door. A lot of my custom uh, work, I would laminate for the stability and reliability of holding the curve. I'd use types of glues that were dried really hard and brittle. So I know with the laminated technique, I'm gonna get such a strong, consistent, stable curve, exactly what I want. When you're working with hard, um, a solid wood panel like this, you have to consider, like we did earlier, the amount of movement that you're gonna experience here. And is it, is it worth it? The nice thing is, 
if you get nice grain like that, you don't even have to veneer it or anything. You can finish with this. Put a nice little, this could be the lid of the jewelry box. Or, let me show you one other thing. Just repeat for us again, it's eight quarter plain sawn or quarter sawn pine. Um, it's eight quarter, you begin with eight quarter plain sawn. Let me show you another piece because I cut that one all up. Oh, I think I got answered here. Eight What's that? Plain, plain, eight quarter plain saw, resaw into quarter saw. Yeah. So if you got eight quarter plain saw like this, can you see the end of that? You see, this is just regular, this is a wide piece of eight quarter, but typically you're going to get it plain sawn. Goose Bay has great white pine, and that's where I got this. So you can see the growth rings coming right across here. This is plain sawn. Over here, it's actually getting into rift. If you go wide enough, you end up getting into, into quarter. But I would just take this, and when you, you, know, you cut it to a shorter length, whatever your door height is, or lid, and you're going to be cutting across, so you're going to end up with quarter sawn. If you buy quarter sawn and do this, you're going to end up with plain sawn on the face, which is what you don't want. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh, Tom, Steve's wondering, could you power sand the inside? You what? Power sand? Yeah, Steve, I think you could um, with uh, an orbital if you held it up on the edge. Because it's not super critical, you might still leave kind of... Um, the fogginess of a faceted surface, but so what? It, it looks kind of cool on the inside. You know you've got a coopered surface. On the outside, though, you want to go until you've achieved this nice fluid surface. Let me just see how it... I don't have it cut to length yet. I don't really want to cut it to length yet because I haven't cleaned it up, but if I did, it would fit right in there similar to that so you can see kind of that and let's put it on this end where we rounded it a little bit tom Kerry's asking what do you think about substituting a mahogany top would that be a stable substitute for white pine yeah mahogany is quite stable as well mahogany quarter sawn would be beautiful it is one of the more stable hardwoods especially the, the genuine i haven't checked the african but the genuine mahogany is traditionally known as a stable wood and it would be beautiful. In fact, quarter saw mahogany gives you a ribbon figure like that. So you get an outstanding kind of ribbony figured front of your door. It'd be really sweet. So um, this could be veneered over and I would do it with the grain going, you could do it right with the grain and you would have a beautiful surface. But there, you would either hammer veneer, you know, because you're dealing with, you know, with hot glue. It's harder, you can't really, you can put this in the press, but you have to have a press, something to support it perfectly on the arc. Or you would crack your, your door. Um, let me show you one other thing. This got me really thinking about making a new version of this cabinet. A little different, more in the James Krenoff world. So this is the curved front door. This is a uh, hanging cabinet that I made some time ago out of ash. And I laminated the door. I've shown you this before. I just, the door was laminated, edged, and then veneered. So this is not a solid wood door. It's a laminated door. But I thought, wouldn't it be great? If you could make more of a utilitarian uh, cabinet out of all white pine, so you ended up having quarter sawn, this is all ash, but, and then made your door solid in that same way. Well, here's a, how you would, I, I cut some other staves while I was at it today, because I was thinking about this project, and this one shows you more how, I like to keep them in order. So if I was making a larger door, I make that arrow on the end of the board before I rip it into strips. Okay, so I've got those. And then I already cut all the bevel. 
So then when I put them down, I'm going to lay them sequentially in the same order. So it's basically a slip match every joint. And when I'm done, I'm going to end up with a door that looks like that. But it's going to bend around. And I did one earlier because I'm just so into it. I wanted a, a taller door to try this out. I'm, I'm excited because I want to just... White pine is such a fun wood to cut dovetails in that this could literally be a pretty short project if you're feeling good about your dovetail cutting because you do through dovetails on the corners and then get this door hung. Now, this door, I've been thinking a lot about the hinge method because Cranoff used um, knife hinges a lot. They, they're really cool because they're, they're almost invisible. And they look great with a, a piece like this. So look at how tight these are. huh? This is the exact same technique. I actually cut all of these angles with the same angle. So the 2.6 because um, I wanted a little stronger curve than the previous one. The previous door was quite flat in relation to this, but I thought this would make a stronger curve. I was looking at the Cranoff version, and he seemed to have a little stronger than I achieved on my first one there. So, Did you say hammer veneer, Tom? Hammer veneer. That's what is we, that? That's using hot hide glue, like... And um, it's an old technique where you, the hammer actually has like a flat nose on it, almost like a hammerhead shark. You know, it's like you're using something like that and you are got a handle on it and you, you don't actually bang with it like a hammer. You, you rub and bear a lot of force around along this flat edge, almost like you're squeegee, but it's, imagine the squeegee is steel instead of uh, soft and you're you're putting the glue on then glue. it's an older but I don't I've only done a couple of, I've done some restoration but it's an acquired skill because a lot of it is temperature related as soon as high glue cools you lose it so everything has to be warm high glue is warm and you hammer on I may do some practice one of these days and share that method with you because it would be really fun. But look at that. Wouldn't that be So this will be a door. And we will make a cabinet that has a like that. Round it off. Put a hole on there, And you, really have some, you could even make some little to make it a little Put some hearts in there. Your, your special camera. <laughs> and you you make the day or cut in some roses whatever you're into you know it would make a nice little but I'm thinking of almost an upscale country version of a cabinet because you're gonna be putting a curve in there but look at that curve compared to this one I've increased the curve factor See that? so this one will be shaped a little nicer but we've got this stronger curve so I'm thinking of sizing this up and then allowing the curve to establish the curve on the crown. I may change this around. Like Krenoff would have a separate piece with a, that he hand cut like a molded edge in. Pretty sweet. But I think we could come up with a project that would utilize this coopering method and be an upscale kind of country personalized piece that would, wouldn't be a real killer to make, especially if you made it out of white pine. Then you could even have the option of using milk paints and things like that to give it a real traditional old folksy look, but a lot of fun, I think, to did, make something like that. Did they use white oak staves like on whiskey barrels? Excuse yes. Me. Oak okay. Yes, white oak was commonly used. It, you couldn't use red because it was too porous, but the white holds it. Then they would char it, and once the liquid goes in, the wood swells and really seals all those tight 
miter joints. So they're already pretty tight, but they're leak proof once you put the liquid in there. Is it difficult? Eric's asking, is it difficult to inlay on a curved door? Um, yeah, probably would be. I mean, you'd have to have a flexible inlay. I can't, have I ever done that? I, well, I've inlaid like keyhole escutcheons on curved doors and things like that. So you're just working on a smaller area. So you just want to, it's just holding that inlay piece firmly while you, usually you outline the inlay piece. So you can't have it rocking. You're just going to make sure it's held down. I would typically, I would tape portions of it and mark around the other side and then retape and then mark the other side. And then once you route the recess, which you could do, you can do it with a handheld router plane or a regular router with a little small bit and you're going to be following the arc. And once you put pressure on it, that inlay will just take the curve. It's, most inlays are not huge, so it's not going to be a big bend or anything on a curved door, but I'm jazzed about this. <laughs> no, I really, I think this would be a lot of fun. And it's kind of cool because we simplified the clamp up process. That was, that's a big kind of headache. If you try to use standard clamps and clamp a rounded form like this with all these angled connection joints. So the tape method is ideal. And um, you probably improve on the kind of tape used. That green tape actually did very, very well. But like I'm saying is you could use a wider tape and get more for your bang for your buck, like a good one or even an inch and a half wide tape. And you really wouldn't have it pull apart at all when you bend it. Yeah, Norman's suggesting maybe a two-leaf door on the right and a two-leaf door on the, on the left. Yes, excellent. Yeah, so you, that's the thing. You can have... Creative. Exactly. You can have like double doors because um, you can do that as well. You could have one overlap the other. I mean, here you're getting kind of big for expansion and contraction, but you can even make your shop tool doors. But I would make them, you know, out of something like white pine so you wouldn't have to worry about all that movement because we know we're, <laughs> we're using the most stable material in North America. So, all right, everybody. Knife hinges, uh, somebody suggested. Yeah, yeah. Ron, thank you, Ron. Yeah. Right, Ron, yeah. That's what I was trying to mention was Cranoff used, always used knife hinges. And they're, they're great. But they're hard to set. There's some trickiness to them. I'm thinking of some other methods that uh, might be easier and pretty clever that are even more blind than that. But we'll, we'll see if I can. I'm going to mess around with this here and there and see if we can come up with a plan. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. I, oh. I do have, um, sorry. Um, Nate's asking, is there a difference between white pine and white fir? Um, I don't know, Nate. I don't, I've not heard of white fir. Um, white fir is very expensive when you buy it for your wife. <laughs> the black fir, I don't know. Maybe the I same. don't know how you would know that. but um, No, you don't like calm. white fir. That's why I haven't gotten yet. <laughs> yeah, Carrie says he would love to see how the hinges get applied to that door someday. Yeah. It would, we, we can show knife hinges. I, I just, um, that's how I did these cabinets. They're pretty sweet, but they're, like I said, they're a little tedious. Um, but they're a beautiful hinge for a door like this because there's no obstruction on the face. All you see is a little tiny flat butt of the, coming out the top and the bottom. Really elegant way of doing it. But I'm thinking of another method that might be pretty cool. I think your mic is dying on us. Is it? Yeah. My battery going out? Oh, okay. Okay. Is my mic okay for right now? Why don't you just use mine? All right, everybody. <laughs> really? That's weird. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being part of this again. Um, we, <laughs> camera lights like right on top of me. Do you want it? Okay. I guess I'll use it. Thank you so much for being part of this. It couldn't happen without you and... I am looking forward to next week when we will have another great surprise. Remember, if you want to be part of the Chester Drawers class, we're picking it up this Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Go ahead and enroll. You'll get full-size drawings and all that. 
It'll be a blast to follow along. Remember, if you like this content, go ahead and check subscribe and click the red button so you get notified when we have new content. Thanks again for hanging out with me in the shop. Look forward to seeing you next time right back here on Shop Night Live. See you then. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. <laughs>